cool. Talking about Twitter layoffs. What else can we talk about today? No, it's kidding. Hey, welcome to the green room. We are here with Disrupt TV, episode number 301. And more importantly, we got some amazing guests. And we'll do quick intros in the green room before we take off. So going in reverse order, who do we have here other than the one and only Ron Miller? Ron, where are you calling in from? I am calling in from Amherst, Massachusetts, where I live. And uh, I guess we're going to be talking about a little bit of news that's been happening in tech this week. So nothing fun. going on. Such a boring industry. <laughs> kind of quiet. <laughs> no scandals. Nothing in crypto. I don't know what's going no. on. All right. <laughs> Very cool. All right, BJ, where are we calling him from? What are you talking about today? Uh, I'm Maui. Maui has been just circling this morning to talk about how human behavior really works. Really works. Very cool. BJ's in Maui. He's talking about human behavior and how it really works, and we'll get in deeper on that. And Daphne, where are you today, and what have you launched? I am in in uh, New York City at Times Square, not having a party at Times Square, but uh, we're going to be talking about this little girl right here, When When They Say You Won't. I launched a book this week and by McGraw-Hill, and just excited to share. Woo-hoo, book launch. Only the best. All right, back to you. And uh, Hannah, go ahead, and Val and I will jump in in a bit. So, All right, let's get going. Ready, set, go. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us on Disrupt TV. My name is Vala Afshar. I'm the Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce and your co-host for the next hour. We welcome you to follow us on Twitter at Disrupt TV Show. Send your questions using hashtag Disrupt TV and if you're verified, we'll answer. No, I'm kidding. It's my pleasure to introduce (laughs) my co-host, Ray Wong. He's the CEO, founder of Constellation Research. He's the best-selling author of Everybody Wants to Rule the World, uh, Surviving and Thriving in the World of Digital Giants. He's a regular television business and tech contributor on Fox Business, Yahoo Finance, Bloomberg. I saw you on Fox today. Ray is a global sought-after keynote speaker and one of the most influential futurists on Twitter at RWANG0, and he is verified. Welcome, Ray Wong, to Disrupt TV. <laughs> I'm here with the one and only verified Bala Asha, the chief digital analyst for Salesforce. And more more importantly, he's also the author of The Pursuit of Social Business Excellence. Executives around the world pay attention to every one of his insightful, inspirational tweets. And when he's not hosting, keynoting, or leading events at Salesforce, you can find him speaking on business TV outlets such as Bloomberg and posting insightful analyses on ZDNet. So, but not about us. It's always been our amazing guests. And who do we have to kick it off today? Ray, as you know, we only invite the best authors in the world to come join us. And without exception, our first guest, Daphne Jones, Fortune 500 board member, former CIO, executive coach, and author of Win When They Say You Won't. (laughs) Daphne has 30 years of experience. She started at age five. uh, (laughs) Experience in general management and executive level roles at IBM, Johnson & Johnson, General Electric. At GE, Daphne served as Senior Vice President of Future of Work, SVP and CIO for Product Engineering, Imaging and Ultrasound, and as Senior Executive and CIO for Global Services. All of those departments composed of the 13 billion, Ray, that's with a B, billion B. dollar segment at GE Healthcare. Daphne serves on several board of directors for AMN Healthcare Inc., Barnes Group, and Mazonite International Group, uh, and is the recipient of numerous domestic and international awards. She recently started a company that teaches leaders how to prepare and serve on boards. Incredible, incredible opportunity to serve on boards. And she's the author of Win When They Say You Won't. You can follow Daphne on Twitter. Very easy. Daphne E. Jones. Welcome back, Daphne, to Disrupt TV. 
Hey guys, this is so fun. I could stay here all day with you. I love this. I love your energy, your passion, your creativity, everything. Hey awesome. there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're so excited to have you back. You know, we had a great time at Constellation Connected Enterprise in October, yes. and you shared with us some great insights on what it means and how to get on the boards. Uh, but let's look back, right? When you started your career as a secretary, did you ever imagine that you'd someday be a CIO or board member or even an author? I mean, this is huge. <laughs> I would say never in a million years, you know, with an M or a B, with a B, billion years. Um, you know, it, the opposite was told to me, you know, because I had no role models. I had no visions of any kind of roles. Like, What was an SVP? What is a vice president? I had no idea. So the opposite was actually told to me by my counselor. He's like, Daphne, don't go to college because you're not going to get in. If you get in, you'll never graduate. And if what? You graduate, nobody will hire you. Yeah, that's a that's a real deal. And, and I think I didn't know it at the time, Ray and, and Vala, but I, I realized that I don't look like success, business success. I'm not a white male, blue eyes, whatever. And the, the system wasn't created by me or for me. So I tended to, I think, remind people or people of color, remind uh, leaders of somebody who may watch their children or may cook their food. And so he put me in that category of being a secretary and I became just that. And uh, he put, yeah, it was incredible, but it was true. And, but I looked past that, but yeah, I never had any idea that I could ever be where I am. And my mom always said I would win, uh, but I never thought that I could because of how I was talked to as a high schooler. So it, it, I guess in a way it explains the title of your book, but um <clears throat> Why did you title the book Win When They Say You Won't? You, you kind of described as a micro example of somebody who told you that college wasn't worth your time. So I get a sense of where that title came from. But can you share with our audience the genesis behind the title? Yeah, win by itself. If you just forget about the rest of the title, just say win. Win, it's a word. It's a command. It's a battle cry. It's a challenge. It's a mm. plea. It's an expectation that we all need to have in, in our mind. So it, it kind of starts about the mindset and ensuring that we have that kind of a mindset. But because I've been told by teachers, bosses, and other people have been told by teachers, bosses, or shown by example that they would not win, people of color, we've been underserved, undervalued, overlooked. I wanted to take those seeds of misdirection that are planted in our minds hmm. and create an antidote because we've been poisoned. Our passion, our purpose, and our positions and professions have been poisoned. And I wanted to create a book that didn't just say when, but also showed you how. And so the fact that it says when, when they say you won't, it kind of infers that I'm going to not only give you a battle cry, I'm also going to show you how to do it. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and and you, you mentioned the difficulty. Um, I, I'm an immigrant refugee. So I, when I, my family and I moved to the States, I didn't speak the language, didn't dress the same, didn't play the same sports. It was awful living in Boston and not knowing how to play basketball, baseball, <laughs> right. uh, you know, football. These are all foreign sports to me. Never seen uh, any of them. So um, I, I can appreciate being different um, and having a little bit of a harder uh, journey. But can you can you talk to us about what's the hardest part of looking different and then having people tell you that because you look different, forget about trying to win. Uh, talk mm -hmm. to us about what, what's the hardest part of climbing the proverbial ladder when when it's when it's you. Well, first of all, being a black woman, I, I went outside what was expected and recommended. You know, I was expected to dream of things that women dream about or black people dream about, not what white men dream about. Mm -hmm. Being a systems engineer, hardly. Programming <laughs> in assembler or RPG, never in a million years. And so I, when I show up at, at places where black women shouldn't be, there's a palpable change in the tone, the conversation, the air, because I'm a mm -hmm. unicorn, you know, and, and you look at it as a black woman in STEM, there was not any of us or there were not many of us. So yeah. people didn't gravitate to me. They looked at me as, as you know, something different. I had no role models. So that's the second thing. No role models mm -hmm. in Peoria, Illinois, where I started my career at IBM, except a white woman in the office. And and so when you think about where, do, where will I learn from, you know, geese learn from geese, you know, tigers learn from tigers. Where does Daphne learn from? There was nobody around to teach me how to to be how to be great. And then finally, uh, the the burden that as a black woman, I had to be perfect, lest anybody that comes after me who's black, it may not work out so well. They may say, you know what, 
you know, the last black girl that we had here, she didn't work out so good. So we're not going to hire you either. And so it was the burden of trying to be that person to help the people coming after me, yeah. but also just navigating where I was. Yeah. I mean, there's some great lessons uh, inside the book. And, and when you talk about this, you know, I mean, you talked about, you know, what, what was important, right? In terms of like not being just getting noticed and pr promoted, right? You don't wait, right? You have to take charge, right? And and when you do that, right, you, you do it in a different way or you do it in a way that, you know, that actually paves the road for other people, right? And in, in terms of, uh, you know, creating that success. Share a little bit about that and, and share a bit like why that is, why that is so important, especially when you're pioneering. So. Yeah, I, what we, my high school counselor told me, go be a secretary. You'll never be in business. I did what he said, but I didn't do it for long. I said, you know what? I shouldn't be a secretary. I should have a secretary. So when I went through college and I got my bachelor's degree in three years and I got my MBA in one year, the audio, what was he was saying in my ears did not match the video playing out in front of my life. So I first said, the counselor is wrong. So it's possible that other people who think they know my own narrative is probably wrong. So you tell yourself that you are amazing. You can do whatever you set your mind to. I think that's one. Number two, you've got to surround yourself with role models and mentors and, and accountability buddies so that they are there to tell you, you know, that you have a blind spot that should be fixed or, or what have you, because we are not here by ourselves and we're not here only for ourselves. So we should surround ourselves with the right people. And they say that whoever is in your circle may not be in your corner. So we got to have the right people that are in mm -hmm. our corner when when we really need help. And I say the third thing um, it was it was about my career path and I realized how to play the game. And it was with the, the tool called Pi, uh, performance, image and exposure and not performing alone is not enough. You have to have the right image, the right brand that shows up the right way, according to the company's values. And then you've got to have the exposure to the right people who will promote you or recommend you for opportunities. And when I, when you see how role models work, they say it's it's okay to be a copycat as long as the, the cat you're copying is really good. So <laughs> you, you gotta be a copycat. And if you don't have people around you, find them um, and learn how to mimic them, mimic their success. And that was really important for me. We had uh, one of our guests, actually the first guest on Disrupt TV was Whitney Johnson. And she's the author of Disrupt Yourself. And in the book, she talked about the importance of sponsors more than mentors. Mentors are great, but she, looking back at her career, and I can uh, admit when I look at, back at my career, a sponsor, someone that put her political social capital on yes. the line, who was yes. above me on the org chart, yes. opening doors, uh, committing resources, introducing me to other influential senior leaders in business. So my trajectory was based on sponsorships. Can you talk about the importance of having a sponsor to help accelerate your career and, and, and help you achieve your goals and ambitions? Sure, absolutely. Um, there are so many stakeholders that are in your life, but a sponsor is one who will, uh, they have political capital, they've got experiential capital, they've got positional capital. Um, and what happens when you're not in the room and you're not on Zoom, there's got to be somebody who's talking about you. Otherwise, if you're not noticed by your sponsor or known by a sponsor who has that high level to, to pull you up, they won't say, you know what, Daphne speaks you know, Spanish. She understands industrial engineering. Maybe she should be the one to go to Brazil to, to start up that new manufacturing facility. Wow. Right. If you're not in the room, you won't ever be considered. If you don't have a sponsor, you may not ever be considered for that amazing opportunity that you might really just be perfect for. And so that sponsor really, they represent you in yeah. Zoom or when you're not in the room. Yeah. So important yeah, the last couple of years when you're really not in the room, uh, you know, everything <laughs> is decentralized and digital. So having a mentor and sponsor in the last two and a half years is key. Is, it would be key. Go ahead, Ray. Sorry. No, and one of the things that we always talk about, you know, is, is this notion of why design and design thinking is important. You talk about the importance of thinking like a designer in terms of crafting your career. What are some of the yeah. at, at things that people should be thinking about? Let's say I'm in my 20s versus I'm in my 40s uh, versus I'm, I'm looking at a board career in my 50s. 
Yeah. Um, so having a design says, and design thinking is really designed for those things that are not really that predictable and are, you know, are kind of crazy. And so it takes into account the market. I believe that we are like a product, uh, Ray. And, and if we think about the iPhone or, or Tesla or whatever, they have a market, they are a product and, and they have people who consume what they offer. And so part of design thinking is you think about the market. Um, you think about how do you like have some assumptions that may be important for you to assume, but they may not be perfect assumptions. And then when you try to do your prototype or put your, your plan out there and test it, um, you have to test it and then you measure and then you learn from it and you tweak it and you go back to your design and then you try it again, but you never quit. And so design thinking is, is good for you to say, well, I don't know everything about what's going to happen to me in my career because it's a lot of humans involved in my career and, and deciding about it. But if you have a goal that you're aiming for, you know your market, you understand what it's going to take for you to test this out there in the market and then you're going to get the feedback and when you get that feedback just like in design thinking you don't take it personally you don't cry you don't quit well maybe you cry but you don't quit <laughs> right and, but you take it strategically you take that feedback as data and you put it back into your model your design plan and you say you know what i learned something from this situation let me take and and put that plan uh that learning back into the plan and so you don't take things personally and get upset. You actually just use it as data to help you move forward. So it's really, it's really a good model. And we do do we do it for applications that we build. We can do it for ourselves as we build ourselves up into our markets. When you're when you're coaching executives, um, I guess regardless of age, how quickly can you tell if they're winning? Like, how do you? Is there is there? Do you have a? Uh, uh, is, is it an interview? Do you spend time shadowing them? Um, do you look at where they want to be and where they are and assess whether the gap analysis is realistic? How do you how do you know if someone is on a winning, or maybe they're just happy and smiling and that's winning enough? I, you know. <laughs> well, I see, but you know, if somebody's winning based on how they define winning. I yeah. mean, uh, somebody may just want to learn how to swim. And, you know, they may want to learn how to be a better spouse. So it depends on what is their goal and their objective. But if you're not doing your purpose and your purpose to me is where your capability intersects with your passion. And if somebody is doing what they, I mean, Ray, y'all are winning because you're <laughs> passionate and you're good. You're good at what you're doing. And so to me. Ray um, is definitely winning. No question. He's winning. He's crushing You guys it. are both winning because you're passionate as heck. And so to me, uh, you define what you want and are you are you doing it? Are you hmm. moving towards it? And, you know, you never quite arrive. Uh, you know, once Roger Bannister broke the four minute barrier, yeah. it didn't stop there. I think yeah. people can now run it in uh, three and 30, not yeah. just 3.59. Right. Um, and, and so you just you you're you're continually improving and going after things. But you also have a peace and a joy about what you're doing. That's awesome. That's what I believe. Yeah. So what's the first step you should take? What's, what's the first step you should take right in this? Uh, yeah, to so, say, um, to begin that process of, you know, starting to win at our careers. Yeah. The, my, in my book, I talk about this one right here, this book right here. Um, I talk about uh, edits, which is a four-step framework. And when you think about the, uh, the application development life cycle, plan, build, run, maintain, that's pretty much how you build apps, right? Yep. Well, you can build your career up that same way. So the first step is envision. Where do I want to go? What is it that I want to be? And you take that vision and your mindset needs to be one of growth, not one that says I'm fixed, I'm done learning, you know, nobody can help me. I cannot grow anymore. Your mindset has to be one of growth that imagines and is open to the possibilities. And so I think the first step is saying, what do I want to be? And remember a time in your career, hopefully it was not 25 years ago, where you were winning, where you were thriving, not just merely surviving. And if you can remember that, what superpowers were on display at that moment? What, what situation were you involved in at that moment? And if you can remember that and say, this is where I really want to be and create that, that vision for yourself. And that's the first thing somebody needs to start with. New promotion, a better wife or a better husband or a better partner, learn how to swim, whatever it is, have that vision for what it is you want to do. That's Love where that. you can start. Love that. Yeah, this is amazing. So um, <laughs> look, when the book came out, exactly what date? 
February, uh, November 15th. Two oh, days, three 15. days ago. Yeah. <laughs> three days ago. That's amazing. Well, here, Brand new baby. Congratulations. <laughs> Daphne Jones, Fortune 500 board member and author of Win When They Say You Won't. You can follow her on Twitter at Daphne E. Jones. So thanks a lot for being on the show. Good luck on the book tour. Thank you. Thank Bless you. you both. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. That's awesome. I love, I love, I love uh, her energy and, uh, and enthusiasm and optimism. You know, in the long run, the optimists create the future. So uh, it's, it's, it's great to see her success. Okay, talk about design in your career. Just talk about design in general. It's amazing. We're honored to have B.J. Fogg, founder, director of the Stanford Behavior Design Lab, uh, B.J. Fogg's Behavior Design Ooh. Boot Camp. Ray, you and I should go to that boot camp. A New York Times bestselling I author. I want to go to that tiny, boot camp. Tiny habits. I know. I, I'm planting the seed in your head, Ray. BJ is a behavioral scientist with deep expertise in innovation and teaching. At Stanford University, BJ has directed a research lab for over 20 years. He's trained innovation to use his work so that people can create solutions that influence behavior for good. In 2002, BJ published a book entitled Persuasive Technology about how computers can be designed to influence attitude and behaviors. And his predictions have been incredibly accurate 20 years later. And by the way, no one was talking about this 20 years ago. Fortune Magazine named BJ new guru, you should know, for his insights about mobile and social networks. What a great time to be a guru in social networks. In 2009, his research interests moved away from persuasive technology towards human behavior in general, especially health habits. This led to creating a new set of models and methods that comprise what BJ calls behavior design. In 2020, BJ wrote about the new and practical use of behavior design in what became a New York Times bestselling book, Tiny Habits. You can follow BJ Fogg on Twitter at BJ Fogg, B-J-F-O-G-G. <laughs> Welcome, Professor Fogg, to Disrupt TV. Hello. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Great to have you, sir. You know we're so excited to be here. I had a chance to sit down with you and some friends in Northern California a few weeks back, you know, and it, it was just impressive just trying to understand what was going on, where the future was headed, but more importantly, where the future of behavior design is going. And as a researcher and innovator at Stanford, what is your biggest discovery in the last 20 years? Well, I would think the the biggest breakthrough in my work in the last 20 years is a model that I call the Fogg Behavior Model. And it describes all behavior uh, uh, for all ages and all cultures and so on. And it's pretty simple. And I, and I drew out a picture to show you how simple it is. It looks like this. Bam. Wow. And it goes that's like it? Behavior. That's it. That's the model, right? <laughs> behavior happens when three things come together at the same moment. There's motivation to do the behavior. There's ability to do the behavior. And there's a prompt. And it turns out that all human behavior can be understood with this model. It's a universal model. And you can also use the model for designing behaviors. And because it is so, it seems very simple on the surface, but there's many, many, many applications. And it, that this model became the foundation uh, for the broader work that I now call behavior design. And that's what my Stanford lab is all about. So, so the map model, uh, can you tell us how someone can use that in everyday yeah. life uh, at work or, or, or at home? Yeah, two ways. As you look at this model, you can use it for analysis. Like, oh, this behavior happened. Um, let's pick an example. Somebody donated to the Red Cross. Well, if they donated, that means they had some level of motivation, mm -hmm. check. They had some level of ability, check. And there was a prompt. The prompt is anything that says do this now or donate now. So you can analyze behaviors, even unwanted behaviors, uh, such as an employee is um, showing up late to a meeting, which is a behavior. And you can analyze that in terms of motivation, ability, prompt. You can flip it around and also use it for design. So I'm talking about analysis, but also design. So you can design for the behaviors you want. And that can be for yourself or for other people. And walking through the steps again, um, make sure the behavior is specific. So let's say you want to drink more water. So be specific. Rather than hydrate more, you might say, drink five glasses of water. Check specific behavior. Next, there has to be some level of motivation to the behavior. And if you pick drink more water, there's probably motivation to drink water. Otherwise, why you pick something else. Then you get to ability. That's how easy or hard the behavior is. And this is where many people 
everyone pretty much understands that there needs to be some motivation to behavior, but they don't understand the important role of ability of making it really easy to do. So in this example, and this is a true example for my life, I just pour the water and I put it on my work desk to make it really, really easy. And the third thing is prompt. There's got to be something that reminds you. Now, I'm not going to use alarms or post-it notes that say drink more water. Instead, the water glass itself is the reminder. There are other ways to design prompts. But the point here is this model, you can analyze and understand why any behavior happened and you can flip it around and you can design systematically for any behavior. Wow, that is I super love powerful. The, I love the simplicity of just having the cup in front of you uh, and having it act as a prompt. Um, it actually works. When I want to drink more, I actually fill up yeah. a glass and leave it on, on, on the desk. And if when I don't do that, I don't drink. <laughs> when I do do it, I drink. Yeah. Well, and let me go further. This may be too detailed, but when you get a behavior to happen, by using an object both to increase ability and to prompt, okay, which is what we're doing here. It increases ability and it prompts you. My Stanford lab, we've given that kind of technique a name. That's called staging. And we do this a lot. For example, you have a, a book you need to return to the library. You put it by the front door, okay? So in order to return the book, you need the book. And if it's by the front door, it reminds you, okay? So you and probably everybody listening, has done this kind of thing before designed for behavior. Well, now it has a name, it's called staging. And what is it doing? It is increasing your ability and setting a prompt at the same time using a physical object. Wow, and, and what's interesting is those three factors, right? How you actually think about motivation, your ability and your prompts, right? They combine to actually create all these tiny habits or in terms of how you how you put this together. So uh, when you think about these you know, tiny habits and, and habits in everyone, you've coached over 40,000 people while you're doing that in these habits, right? And there are all types of habits, right? Yeah. Some of it is like, you know, work. Some of it is like personal motivation. Some of it is like, you know, maybe health. Uh, talk about this. What have you learned from these people? Wow. You know, it's kind of insane. When I started coaching people, so I, about 11 years ago, 12 year, years ago, I was hacking my own behavior and I found this really easy way to create habits and I named it tiny habits. And then I thought, well, let me teach some other people this method. Maybe it's just that I'm weird and it works for me and not others. So I started teaching people and it worked for others. And then what happened was people started talking about on Twitter so week after week, two to 300 people would sign up to be coached by me through email. So I'd work with them individually. And this happened year after year after ever since 2011. And so there was a certain point where I like, okay, let me count how many people I've coached. And at one point it was 40,000 and then it was 60,000, which is massive. And so what wow. you learn by that kind of coaching week after week over and over many, many, many people is what really works, what doesn't. And a few things, a uh, few important takeaways. One is that you need to pick habits you actually want. Okay, don't pick the shoulds. For the shoulds, you don't have enough motivation. Okay, <laughs> and if you actually want a habit, then you have some motivation. Number two, you need to make the habit really, really easy to do. Uh, like you set, it's, it's like you're setting the bar really low on the habit. So in my own life, uh, years ago, I wanted to do more push-up strength training. So I didn't pick 20 push-ups. I picked two, just two. And just when two? I wanted to do more, I go, just, just two, because you set the bar low, right? Right. Because yeah. if I pick 20 or 30, then my motivation level would have to be high to do it. And the days I wasn't motivated, I wouldn't do it, right? That's human nature. But if you pick just two, that's so easy. It's not so dependent on motivation. And then three, you design this habit into your life what and you think what does it come after what does it naturally come after and oh i didn't think i was going to use this example but i'll keep going for me push-ups come after after i pee i do two push-ups so in the tiny habits way it's after i pee when i'm at home <laughs> i will do two push-ups now i will often do more than that but if i only do two that's great you know success uh and go on my way so you're designing habits into your life. You're not using willpower. You're not using discipline. You're using design and then iteration. 
So if it doesn't work, let's say you ju really just don't like push-ups. Pick something else. You pick squats or you pick maybe uh, counter push-ups against the bathroom counter. So the people that are able to have the courage to make the habit really, really easy to do. And some people simply won't do that. I don't know why, but those people aren't very good at creating habits. And the people that look at it as a design challenge, like here, I'm going to try this. And if it works, I keep going. If it doesn't, I'm going to change it and change it and adjust it. So in Tiny Habits, we talk a lot about a practice and revise. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing that I learned is people that are willing to reinforce themselves and say, I did a good job or way to go. And sometimes it's just thinking of your purpose. Like I might, you know, the, the bar is very low, two push ups, but let's say I do 12 or 20 or 30. And then I, as I'm doing those, I'm thinking, good for you, BJ. You are almost 60 now and you are doing what you need to stay strong, both of your muscles and your bones. So I'm <laughs> self reinforcing. That's really important. And that's, how habits form. It's not repetition. It's the emotion we feel when we do the behavior. And in the tiny habits method, you hack the emotion. You do it deliberately. You deliberately cause yourself to feel successful. So you're deliberately self-reinforcing. And the better you are at that, the faster the habit forms. That's awesome. That's so awesome. And uh, you've motivated me to go back to doing push-ups. There was a time where I could do a decent <laughs> number. I could do pull-ups and push-ups, and I don't remember the last time I've, I've done a push-up. So I, I'll, I'll start with two and maybe stick to less than 10 so I stay motivated yeah. because well, I, morning, have, I, have a, I have a bad habit of keep adding. <laughs> Once the ability grows, no. I get bored. So, you know, so it becomes yeah. more obsessed about more and more, and then then I don't look for the prompts. <laughs> I just, yeah. you know. Well, you, you, you know, you've got to adjust over time. Yeah. Um, I started doing, oh, 100 to 150 push-ups a day. And Whoa. I like that, you know, and I thought that was super cool. And then guess what? I injured my elbow, um, like, <laughs> like a tendon issue. So I'm completely off push-ups now until it heals, probably because I overdid it, because I ended up just loving the push-ups and loving the progress. I like, <laughs> hear you. And so now I do squats. Um, and I'm just push waiting to be able to get back to push-ups. And I didn't used to love push-ups years ago, but because I've done a lot of them and I'm ready to get back to push-ups. So is this, is this boot is camp? Is this boot camp that Ray and I are going to sign up for? Is it going to be physically hard for us? Or we're going to be swinging from ropes? No, it's just going to be, it's, it, it, it's a, it's a blast. What I do in my boot camp, we work with about 12 uh, leaders or innovators, uh, products and services, and I teach them the models and methods of behavior design that you can't learn anywhere else. And it's super fun, yeah. but it is, um, it's boot camp. I call it boot camp for a reason. It, you know, um, will work you hard, but in a very fun way and in a very practical way. And I love teaching it. So we're doing uh, some on Zoom right now. And then in the spring, when I'm back in California, we'll do some in person. And it's like 12 people, um, intensive, and no, we don't do push-ups. Is it hard? <laughs> I don't think it's, I mean, it's my job as a teacher and I love teaching to help everybody succeed. Sure. So it's, it's really my responsibility to help people learn this in the most practical way so they can have a big impact on their Hey, career. now, BJ, you're, you're working on something new. What is this new thing that you're popping up in a Stanford lab? Like uh, you got a whole new yeah. project. We're kind of curious. Are you allowed to talk about it? Yeah, I am. I absolutely a, a new direction that emerged earlier this year. And now we're uh, really ramping it up. We are researching how to help people create stronger professional relationships. And oh, we are wow. starting with students. Yeah. You know, and we're starting with students and there's a new way to visualize those relationships and their uh, specific actions that work better than others and so on. And so, yes, it relates to habits and tiny habits, except for it's in the service of creating strong professional relationships. And that is a super exciting project. It'll be our main focus the rest of this year and throughout 2023. When, when I think of healthy relationships, the word that pops in my mind is trust. Can you develop tiny habits to become more trustworthy? Yes, for sure. You know, in this case, we're looking at professional relationships. Although the students, so I, 
I created a new course at Stanford for this as well. They don't have a lot of professional relationships, so it's also going to personal ones. But yeah, there, there's things that you can do to uh, be vulnerable, uh, mm. to um, have empathy and express empathy. And one of the biggest things, and there's not a name yet for this technique, but everybody, um, you're probably familiar with this dynamic. When you work in a team that's interdependent, let's say there's three people on the yeah. team and everybody must come through for the team to succeed. And if yep. anybody doesn't, you don't, that interdependence, those situations of interdependence where people come through really builds that bond and builds trust. Wow. Yeah, Whether it's sports or here in Hawaii, canoeing, or we're cooking a Thanksgiving dinner, you know, interdependence and working together cooperatively and successfully seems to accelerate um, or strengthen both personal and professional relationships. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you've ever wow. played team sports, you, you totally appreciate, you know, the guy bringing the ball up court depends on the forward and the center and the other yeah. peer guard and everybody has a role and yeah, a breakdown in any one of the, uh, you know, the functions or positions or, uh, and the team loses. So absolutely. Well, what, one of my friends here in Maui, I was talking to him about this last week and he's on a canoe club and canoeing is the number one sport here in Hawaii, sure. you know, usually six man canoe. And, and there yeah. are these canoes they do from one island to the other. And some of them are just legendary for being difficult, where the canoes will flip. It's called huli and so on. When those people reach the other island in general, they are, even if they didn't know each other before, they are hugging each other and they are so bonded because they went through this experience where every single person mattered in yeah. that. Um, and we can pick. I'm sure everybody can think of examples that are less um, dangerous than canoeing from one <laughs> island to the other in the rough seas. But um, what we're trying to do in this research is help the students create professional relationships now and mm. understand how those work so they're happier now. Yeah. Students have a lot of mental health challenges right now, even at Stanford. Yeah. The disappointment, the frustration, the anxiety, pandemic really put a twist on things. And so the hypothesis of the class, and we're running this as um, a study, is to see if focusing the students on this and helping them will help them with issues of anxiety and feeling of belonging. And then along with that is helping them visualize the relationship so we have a new way of doing that. And also what are the most impactful actions people can take? And we hope by the end of the year to have sort of a top 20 list a draft top 20 list and then refine it um, in the months and the year ahead. So we're very confident of here are the simplest but most impactful actions you can do to strengthen your professional relationships. I see a, another book called Big Relationships. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. You heard it here for us. Uh, that's my or, or maybe more, more, more maybe the Malia effect, you know. But hey, short of sitting well, on a six seat, you know, out, Malia outrigger, right? And, and and doing this. How does the Stanford Lab project help people right now? Like what are you what are you doing? What can people get started on? Well, we're we're in the early stages of this. So we invite people. So we have this 35 minute workshop that we can do online through Zoom. And yes, we've done it with Stanford students, we've done it with Stanford managers. We're looking to do it with other people to see if the results are the same or different. And so even though it's early, people could email me and we could Zoom based, uh, right? It's video yeah, based. Zoom based. Right? We could train you or a, a, a team of people on your company. Um, and just email me at bjfog at stanford.edu. And it might take a few weeks to get back to you. Students are going into finals, <laughs> et cetera. But we will get to you. And we really do want to do the research on how do you help people understand their relationships better? And then how do you help them strengthen you know, those relationships? And this is perfect is for sales kickoffs. This is perfect yeah. for sales kickoffs, yeah. you know, kickoff things. I might want to do, I, I might call you up. What am I doing for yeah. our winter wonderland retreat? I mean, this is, this is fun stuff. So. It really is. It really is. And it's so important today in, in a more decentralized digital first economy. How do you build relationships? You're not breaking bread as much. You're not, you're not in person, yeah. you're not reading a room. All that contextual intelligence of being in person is, in my opinion, significantly eroded in the last two and a half years. So I can see why students are having a tough time yeah. because, you know, imagine a high school student who didn't get to see friends and, and teachers and, 
mentors and then they start yeah. the university career and it's hard. It's just hard. Well, and you're right. But what happens when we guide people through this workshop? Um, they recognize they do have more relationships than they thought. They have more people supporting and helping them. They thought awesome. that's part of it, awesome. right? And just like I said, within 35 minutes, uh, people are feeling more like they belong, more supported. They tend to like the organization better. So just by doing this, both the managers like Stanford better, and so did the <laughs> students. They get more clarity on what they want to do, and they get more motivated to strengthen the relationships. Right. So. Right. Now, there were a few people going through it that said, I really don't have many relationships. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that did happen. But most people go, oh, my gosh, by going through this exercise, I do feel uh, more sensitive to how many people I have around me. Yeah. Um, and that visualization that we're doing, we think we haven't tested this yet, can become a source of support when people are feeling support and motivation and encouragement when people are feeling overwhelmed. I know I do this in my own life. I have um, these visualizations for different kinds of, I have a Maui one and a California one and a professional one and a former student one. And it was about a month ago, I was feeling kind of overwhelmed and down. And I just, just by looking at the, uh, it's called buddy map, at the buddy map, I was uplifted and it's like, oh yeah, I'm not alone. I have That's a whole awesome. bunch of people I could call on. And it was just, and so we haven't tested that yet, uh, but we'll get there. And the hypothesis is by doing this and by using the buddy map on a regular basis that you will feel um, less lonely, yeah. more optimistic, BJ, et cetera. Terrific. BJ, I'm getting, I'm getting texts from people asking questions. And uh, here's one that's actually interesting. Um, does behavior design help identify early stage startup success stories? Um, this, this came in. And then are there other examples uh, that, that you see for yeah. early stage startups? So, so this is coming from Andy Weinstein. Design. So, Thank you, Andy. Thank you. When you back out to behavior design, which is the broad umbrella for my work, Yes, if you're looking at any kind of new product or service, any startup, most of them have to deal with you've got to change somebody's behavior. Okay. Just and if, if it's not that, then my work doesn't apply. But if you need to change somebody's behavior, whether it's internal or engineer behavior or company culture or end user, what you need to do is there's two questions. Is the venture helping people do what they already want to do? That's number one. And I call mm. that fog maxim number one. It's help people do what they already want to do. If you're doing a company that's not helping people do what they already want to do, <laughs> that's not going to work. Okay. It's just not going to work. Number two, help people feel successful. Okay. So what you yep. need to do is make sure people feel successful. So it's those two things, helping them do what they already want to do and helping them feel successful. And if a company is doing those things, they have a chance of mm. succeeding. If they miss either one of those, they will not succeed. Wow. Guaranteed. So, th they so will this not. is the Zoom. Is this like the Zoom blue jeans example that you guys did in 2015? <laughs> well, let, let, let me, um, I don't have that good a memory of that. I, I, um, <laughs> I, I'm more focused on uh, recent things. But let me let me give an example. Somebody called me yesterday from Sweden, and she was very interested in helping employees reduce their stress through mindfulness. OK, ah. and so which which and as she was explaining it to me, what I'm listening for is number one, the way you're approaching this. Are you helping people do what they already want to do? Hmm. Then and check. She was And then number two. Are you helping people feel successful? And in hmm. this approach, she was going to have like a checkbox every day. People did it and didn't do it. And that kind of visualization is not going to help people feel successful. You miss a day and you look bad. And oh, by the way, <laughs> mindfulness and meditation is one of the hardest new habits to form yeah. because we don't naturally feel successful doing that. Yeah. Whereas push-ups, yeah. you actually do. Push-ups gives you this little nudge out thing. <laughs> so in her project to be successful, to make it work, she really has to think carefully of how do we help people feel successful, even if they are feeling stressed, frustrated with mindfulness and meditation and calming their mind. Wow. Bala, I think you and I are going to look a little buffer in a six I'm months. I'm starting push-ups yeah. starting tomorrow. 
two. <laughs> I can do two. I can do two. <laughs> I can do two. I can do two. We're here with BJ Fogg, founder and director of the Stanford Behavior Design Lab, BJ Fogg's Behavioral Design Bootcamp, and New York Times bestselling author of Tiny <laughs> Habits. Thanks a lot, my friend. Thank BJ you. Fogg, you can follow him on Twitter at hey, BJFOGG. So. That was awesome. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I, yeah, I think it's the prompts that I'm missing. I need more prompts. Uh, I need prompts. Like, I need prompts. You know, the water, water helps uh, if I didn't have the water. And I've always been wondering, you know, how many push-ups can Ron Miller do after he pees? No, <laughs> Not many, I'm afraid. I, I need some prompts. <laughs> I definitely need This prompts. is going to be breaking yeah, news on TechCrunch. <laughs> I, I have been on this show many times in the past, and it's been a while, but every time I'm on here, I follow these, like, just such incredibly smart and talented and articulate people. I'm like, what do people want to yeah, listen yeah. to me for? Our to producers people. have been told to do that on purpose. Find best-selling <laughs> authors, Nobel Prize winners, and then put Ron afterwards. Ron Miller <laughs> like, Enterprise. Biography, there's just not that much there, you know? <laughs> well, for those of you who know, one of our favorite guests, um, Ron's uh, uh, reporter for uh, TechCrunch. He's been reporting TechCrunch for eight years. He's, uh, our show's only six years old, but Ron's been a repeat guest because we love his fresh insights. Uh, I like the fact he's a Bostonian and a sports fan. Uh, we, he's, I think the Celtics still look really good and might actually Thank maybe you. even go back to the finals. Um, if, 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 you know, I think the only Milwaukee will keep him from doing that. Other than that, I think we've got a clear <laughs> path. Um, Ron's been a longtime contributor, uh, our editor at eContent Magazine. He's a great follow on, at tw on Twitter at Ron underscore Miller. Welcome back, Ron, to Disrupt TV. And any tiny habits you want to share with us? Is there anything you want our network to learn? I'm, I'm going to leave that um, to that conversation. <laughs> but, but I have to say that Ray strikes me as one of the most motivated people I know. So I can't possibly see him like... You know, and the stage is his prompt like because he's around the world <laughs> on big stages presenting all the time. Yeah. So he, there's no lack of prompt for. for well, in fact, I, he's I want to start right by asking. Stage. <laughs> I, yeah, there is a stage. Well, I want to start. I want to start by asking Ron. I mean, you had this amazing interview with the Figma CEO, and let's yes. start there because there's been some crazy stuff. And if you think about where the world's headed, I mean, it is going to look more like Figma than our current analog world. So, what was like? What was that like? So, I mean, that was pretty exciting. First of all, it was like the first time in three years that we had Disrupt Live, you know, since 2019, yeah. I think was the last time we did it. Yeah. So just to be in person again was, you know, really exciting. And um, it was also, you know, the first time that I've been on stage in three years. So that in itself was, I mean, I was a little more nervous than I normally yeah. am when I go on stage. I'm not typically very nervous. But I was partly because I was interviewing Dylan and partly because I hadn't been on stage in such a long time. But, you know, once you get out there, it's like, OK, here we go. Um, and interviewing Dylan, of course, was just, you know, it was fascinating to do at this moment in time because. And the deal prior, hasn't even closed. So. No, no. But, but yeah, but a month prior, they had announced the deal, the $20 billion deal with Adobe. And so, you know, getting to talk to him about that and about how he felt about it and how he. Uh, you know, what his motivations were. And, you know, like my, my questions were kind of geared towards trying to figure out like why he did it. Because I don't know if you followed Figma, which has been a phenomenal story of startup success. You know, he started in the dorm room, quintessential stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, went out to, uh, you know, California on a Teal scholarship, our fellowship, and, uh, you know, took three or four years to build the product, which, you know, you think now, like if you had a startup that took three and a half years to build a product, people would be like, what is going on? You know, like, <laughs> is this guy for real? But, you know, what they were doing was really hard. They were trying to produce this product design um, service in a browser, which just really hadn't been done prior to that. I mean, we have, you know, Jamstack now and all of that. But I think at that point in 212, 13, 14, he, you know, nobody was really doing what he's was trying to do. So he took this company and the interesting dynamic here, I think, was that Adobe had always been like, you know, I remember back in the day, Box went after Microsoft. They had those big SharePoint um, billboards on, on the 101 about, you know, like, you know, Box is simple and SharePoint is really hard. And, you know, Figma, would, for them, that was Adobe, you know, and Adobe was the, the big corporation that they were going to displace. And 
and, and their community, which they took very seriously building this community, I think really bought into that idea that, you know, you know, we are this new kind of way of thinking, new way kind of way of working, and we're going to displace, you know, the, the, the we're, we're going to disrupt the, the, the incumbent. Mm -hmm. And the incumbent was seen in the creative world as being Adobe. And so I asked him about, you know, like, how do you kind of reconcile that fact that you were kind of going after Adobe and, and you, uh, you know, you, you, you were, you were now if the deal goes through, because it is facing a lot of regulatory scrutiny, if it goes through, would become a part of Adobe. Yeah, no, that was, that was, it, it was great to see the conference in person. Good to see uh, you on stage. Um, you recently wrote, uh, I thought you recently wrote about is web three, uh, really the new phase of the internet. Uh, right. Any thoughts about that, especially given the turmoil we've experienced the last, um, you know, last week or so? You know, what turmoil, it's... man. What are you talking about? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, between you and I, I mean, I, disassoci I disassociate Bitcoin and its technology and digital currency and store of value to actors, whether good or bad. So for me, you know, I mean, I hate to see a 20% hit in the price uh, we went from 21 to 16, and I think it's staying at that. But, I, you know, my point of view is, is I, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I don't, I, I still believe the technology is sound. It's just we need to find better ways to regulate folks in the industry. But anyway, I forget about what I, what, what was your, what were your thoughts about Web three? And uh, okay, so you know, if, if he, this story has been developing for a long time. This particular. Yeah piece that you talked about i, I mean months yeah. ago like going back to like january I, yeah. I saw this discussion on twitter about web one and web two and i thought people were kind of misrepresenting what happened and being of a certain age i actually lived through it and <laughs> and so i started to write what essentially was like you know could have been a book a yeah. history of the internet <laughs> and, and uh you know went through a lot of iterations you know after three or four months i had shared it with people so what am i missing what do i have to add and, you know, the, and, and there were three sections. There was the section on, you know, the, the early phases of the web, yeah. uh, web 2.0, which was really a thing. I mean, you know, we went from, you know, kind of static websites to be able, being able to create content and, you know, having people add content to the site for you rather than yeah. having to create web copy, which is what we did in the 90s. Yeah. And, and so my, my, my thinking was, okay, we have this web, one and web two, which in my mind, you know, were like naturally evolving phases. Yep. Like, so what we have now is we have a group of people who want to, well, who are telling us that web three, whatever that is, mm -hmm. you know, involving crypto <laughs> and blockchain would be the next kind of logical step to that. And so I kind of walked readers through that. My, my week, area honestly was web three and a lot of what took so long was i had to find a co-writer and and i went one of my colleagues uh, anita runs away um you know who does write about um uh you know th this this market stepped up and and helped me finish yeah. and you know that's what came out this week and i think one of the key things here that i'm trying to get across without you know necessarily expressing uh a, a an opinion in the article uh, is that in, in the first two phases, people made a lot of money by being early, right? I mean, yeah. Mark Andreessen, who is a guy who, you know, yeah. now runs Andreessen Horowitz, yeah. one of the co-founders, um, you know, created Netscape. He was one of, the, he, that was one of the key pieces of plumbing of the early web, right? Yeah. Before we had a browser, we didn't have anything to look yeah. at, right? We were looking at text. And, <laughs> and so he created that. And then by being an early, I mean, he became a billionaire. You know, Jeff Bezos yeah, launched 94. Amazon in 94 when nobody yeah. was on the web. He became a billionaire. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the name escapes me, but the guy who started, um, you know, eBay, you know, in 95 became a billionaire. Um, you a know, so everybody a who was out there early yeah. became yeah. a billionaire. Sure. And then if you look at Web 2, you know, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg being the leading figure. I mean, and you go back to Google. I mean, those guys are wealthy beyond belief too. And so, <laughs> so being early created wealth, right? Yeah. And so if you had a third wave, well, and you were early, well, you know, you do the math, right? Just yeah. make the connections. You could be tremendously wealthy. And it's interesting that, uh, you know, Mark Andreessen himself was, and his firm yeah. has been, you know, really pushing the, the 
the message that yeah. this is the third phase of the web. So my my question was, my thesis was like, okay, here's what web one and two look like. Does yeah. this look like those two phases? And if it doesn't, what's going on here? And yeah. um, you know, that just so happened that I finished it and FTX blew up. So I'm like, well, <laughs> <it's exciting. Let's laughs> yeah. Yeah. good timing there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it was pure yeah. coincidence, but it really worked out. <laughs> I, 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 I just believe there is a tokenization of the internet. It, it's going to create an ability to monetize. I see what Time Magazine has been doing for two years, and Keith Grossman there has created a community that's just unbelievable community behind the Time brand. And it's because it's incentivized model that's shared. The artists are continues to perpetually getting rewarded for their work. Where in the past, if you created a cover for Time Magazine, you'd get paid once, Time owns the property, and you're done. Um, now you've got this creator economy built, uh, and it's 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 creating an incredible. Anyways, just one case study that to me right. speaks to doing it in the right way, where you know you absolutely lean into community and ensure their success. Um, and, and it's not about technology. It's not, at some point, we're not gonna talk about music on an MP3 player. We don't care, we don't, you, know, you don't talk about that. That's when we actually, I think we'll reach a point where it matters is people stop talking about the ledgers and, and, and tokens and crypto, and it's just the outcome and the experience that's new. Um, but it was a great article, keep, keep pushing this, because I think all the executives that I have the fortune of consulting with, collaborating with, they're, they're asking questions about the metaverse and Web3 they, because they see the startups investing ahead of the enterprise. So, I mean, even our my co-host wrote a seminal report last year that talked about the landscape being measured in in, in, in T's, not B's. Uh, so uh, I, I well, want to follow up. That if, you, if, you, if you look at the decentralization element of this, that 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 part of it and uh, like taking crypto and blockchain out of it, I think of the equation. I think that would fit with Tim Berners-Lee's vision of an yeah. open web because part of the problem and what, yeah. what you know, the, the guy who invented the web yeah. has been trying to yeah. do since he did it, he's never made a penny off it, you know, I no. mean, which is remarkable, right? It and is. and what he's been trying to do is, is wrestle control from these large entities, whoever the yeah. large entity of the moment is. Yeah. And I think, you know, and I can't speak for him, but I think that he would get behind the idea of, you know, instead of having these kind of yeah. large companies controlling what's going on, you know, whether it's Google yeah. or Facebook or whatever, um, to have this decentralization, that would be valuable. And I think it would be valuable to everybody. Yeah. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether we can get there and whether that represents like a new phase, that's that's to be determined, I guess. Yeah. So, Ron, let's switch some topics. Uh, okay, which one do you want to take? Yeah. Tech layoffs for 500 or Twitter, Twitter troubles for 1,000? Twitter. All three Twitter of us are on it. You gotta... <laughs> All right. So, so, you know, Twitter is, I mean, it's it's like just wild what's happening there. That, uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't even quite understand it, how you can take this viable company and then all of a sudden, you know, you, you, you have no employees. Um, you know, you buy it for $44 billion, you would think that there would be some due diligence, you would think there would be some planning. Um, I, I'm not an Elon Musk's hat, I don't know what he was thinking. But I think that, you know, something has to happen here to, to uh, you know, keep this company going. Because when you lay off almost 50% of your staff, and then, you know, you have reportedly a bunch more people leaving through this voluntary layoff, um, you know, you wonder who's standing up the site. It's an extremely complex piece of technology and, I mean, mix of technology that makes this company run, which makes this service run. So and it wrong. requires high-level engineers to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that staff of thousands or at least hundreds of high-end engineers, it's going to break. And it may not Ron, be today, I... and it may not be tomorrow, but at some point, it's going to break and nobody's going to be there who knows what they're doing to fix it. My last contact at Twitter in engineering just left. There's a thousand engineers left is what he said. And basically Elon's trying to eliminate 75 to 80% of the workforce in one full swoop. And he's not getting the numbers he needs, even with the voluntary uh, exodus, right? Crazy. And the package. So, so just so you know, he's thinking he needs a much smaller footprint and that is like unbelievable. So 
Well, no, I mean, you know, that he was trying I, to I, shut down microservices this yeah. week, which is was like kind of a willy nilly exercise because he said it's too complex. And it is. And it's, it's to the extent that I understand it, and I'm not an expert on Twitter or how it operates in the back end. But from what I understand, it's an extremely complex set of microservices working in tandem to keep all of the different pieces of the platform running. Right. And if that's the case, <laughs> like you can't juggle all those balls with fewer you know, jugglers. You need to have people there to be able to do it and people who are highly skilled. And you know that, that's, that's the other thing. Like if you, if you flush this engineering talent out on the street, like engineers, even with all the tech layoffs, which is another subject we were gonna to touch upon, mm -hmm. but with all these tech layoffs, uh, you know, engineering talent remains at a premium and you know it's not like people are going to come running back even if it becomes you know it, there's a message out that look you know we, we want everybody back we, we we're going to get in the ceo to kind of manage this elon's going to take a back seat and just you know be be a uh, you know a board member maybe that would work but i mean there's just so many people who want these kinds of engineers and then if you look at you know the area that i cover a lot which is startups you know, this is going to be an opportunity for a lot of these engineers to say, look, you know, I've just been put out on the street. I've, I've run these like high end services at these big companies, whether it's Meta, you know, with all the people that they laid off or Amazon and all the people they laid off or it's 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 Twitter. You know, these engineers have been running services inside of these organizations. And I see this a lot. I see a lot of people that come from Uber, they'll come from Meta, they'll come from Twitter, and they'll be say, they'll say, you know, like I ran this or I created this inside this company because we had the resources to do it. But most companies don't, right? Most companies don't have thousands of engineers. Most companies have 20, you know? So they create these services that put these complex things in the hands of, you know, smaller entities, more mortal kinds of operations that, you know, a Google or a Facebook or a yeah. Twitter or, you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, could do because they have these huge stops. Yeah. And I could see, you know, a happy outcome of this kind of craziness is that we get a lot more startup activity because these people, you know, have this kind of uh, talent and they're, it's not being used. You know, uh, we all know he has incredible experience in payments. Uh, that's his roots. He has incredible experience with the internet. I mean, he's launching satellites and so he understands the uh, the infrastructure requirements of building, uh, you know, high performing internet. And he's built arguably the two most successful companies on earth in the in the automobile and democratization of space travel. And it, which has led to being the, obviously the richest human on earth. It's hard to bet against them. Uh, and I know it appears madness, but I mean, on Twitter, you're gonna, gonna it, it's the signal to noise is much noisier. Uh, in terms of uh, you know folks that are that are that are watching what's happening, I, my, my sense is there is method to this, and um, it's hard. I to hope move. you're I, right. I, I hope just, you're right. <laughs> so I think the platform may become smaller, temporary, but better, and then over time maybe it improves because there was definitely room for improvement. Even no platform is perfect, but I mean, and, I mean, if there, there was I, one of my colleagues shared a tweet this morning about how everybody was. Uh, you know, complaining on Twitter was complaining about how how uh, you know Elon broke Twitter, but like let's not forget people were complaining about Twitter long before Elon. Yeah, came I mean, you know, again, I well, love well, it. Well, the, and the, the, no platform is perfect, but but it's just hard for me to when you look at this person's track record to not give them the benefit of the doubt. I just hey, know. the funniest the funniest tweet was I I used to work at Twitter. I was responsible for badging everyone into the office. That. that was the best <laughs> one this morning. But but hey, real quick, lightning round. We got to go soon. Um, but real quick, uh, Sam Bankman Free, does he go to Dubai or does he go to jail? Uh, what's your call? <laughs> I don't know, but I think he goes to jail. <laughs> the Bernie Madoff of the century. <laughs> I defer to Ron. <laughs> He knows more I'm about it than I do. Folks, if that's yeah. the lightning question, I'm, yeah. <laughs> uh, if, if he, he, I mean, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Ron, it's been such a long time. We're so excited to have you back. The one and only Ron Miller Enterprise Reporter at TechCrunch. And of course, you can find him at Ron underscore Miller for his insights. And of course, amazing, amazing detailed insights and reporting on what's happening in the enterprise tech world. Thanks Thank a lot. You, Ron. Great it's seeing you. Great to see you again. Cheers. Oh, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
This Listen, is crazy. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, you know, the biggest influence in life is habit. So if you want better outcomes, better habits. And thoroughly enjoyed, uh, you know, Daphne crushing through the wall of doubt and uncertainty and becoming who she is now, which is going to be an, an author, an executive, a board member, a coach. BJ was just awesome. I, you know, I love the simplicity of his model. You know, I always say smart yes. people use simple language. You didn't need, it wasn't a, you know, a, a Laplace transform, you know, equation. <laughs> it was just, you know, it was, it was the, the it's map, motivation, ability, and, and, and uh, prompt. Like, I'll remember that, you know, um, uh, and, and Ron is always brings a refreshing, uh, uh view of, of, uh, of, of what's happening and, and his articles are, are must read. And, and he does, a, he works really hard to capture a very uh, complete view of, of, of the companies and individuals that he covers. Uh, we will not have a show next week, Ray. So you are off next week, <laughs> uh, but we'll be back the following week, which is December 2nd, December 2nd. And it'll be episode 302. We'll start with Tiffany Bova, global growth evangelist at Salesforce. We'll follow with Dr. Richard Winters, author of You're the Leader, Now What? <laughs> and we're, uh, we'll, we'll have a surprise guest that we're going to announce uh, before. And that surprise guest will, will not be guest. Pierre Simon Laposse. So we will not be talking about <laughs> complex frequency design. No, <laughs> um, but no, yes. No, <laughs> Ray, your final thoughts. Uh, you know what? It's, uh, it's an amazing time. We're seeing a lot of shifts. Um, I think we're in the middle of a massive, massive disruption. We're not sure how to describe it yet. It's not about business models, but my guess is it's about systems. The systems we're living in are about to change at a level we have not been able to comprehend. We're operating at machine scale in a human scale environment. And I think that's the thing that's going to break. Uh, and, and I think the companies that understand where decentralization will address the human scale model to the machine scale model that is what we're going to be watching over the next five years wow. so but that just came to me anyways but anyways <laughs> hey if it's friday it's disrupt tv thanks a lot for watching so it's every recorded. 11 a.m pacific we'll be visiting your <laughs> forecast <laughs> uh, see you everyone see two weeks happy thanksgiving happy for friday who happy thanksgiving. thanksgiving cheers